there's a great kind of joy and fun in seeing buddies and dudes that you know who are in a place where you want to be or you are and having that appreciation and seeing them. And I think it's a very healthy thing for guys to find those types of relationships. And I think yoga is a great place to have those interactions because usually you're in a class or several guys, you maybe you're not pals after the first uh, down dog. But when you have the repeat overlap and interactions and you get to know that person, it's great having those kind of guys in your lives. Welcome to Guys Talking Yoga, a podcast created to help inspire men to consider the practice of yoga by sharing the stories and paths of other guys. I'm your host, Derek Van Du Walker, and today I've got two of my favorites back on the show, Richard Driscoll and Johnny Gillespie. Richard's a longtime Buddhist meditation practitioner and teacher, and Johnny's the founder and owner of the Empower Wellness Yoga and Fitness Studio in Wilmington, Delaware. This conversation is about learning to channel into your dharma. You know, what is your path? What is your program? And learning to really be present in life. And we start out talking about this notion of dharma bombs. Anyhow, thanks for listening. Johnny, will you just speak to a little bit of how you and Richard connected just so the listeners know what the what the relationship is? Uh, yeah, so it was probably 2007 or 8, Richard, was it? Exactly. Yeah, on a Thanksgiving day, which is the busiest day in most yoga studios across the United States, I don't know the world, but Richard and Allison um, showed up at the studio to practice, or I don't know whether Richard was there, Allison was definitely there, and I had just been manifesting more mature Dharma teachers, um, more empowered, because I knew through my relationship with David Nickturn, that the downward dog was going to get pretty boring if there wasn't any underlying foundational philosophies uh, that's that you were studying. And so I met David in 2005. And then when I met Allison, Richard's uh, wife, who's a Dharma teacher and Richard's a Dharma teacher, meditation teacher, I just said, I've been looking for you. And voila, Allison was there. And then she brought Richard. And the rest, as they say, is history. I love it. I got to say, I've had many conversations with both of you guys in separate moments in different places in different states. And uh, I've always found that the time moves very fast with you guys. And it's always just the top layer. Like there's literally like a whole nother place to go and explore. I've been looking forward to having both you guys on uh, because number one, just knowing there was an energy in a conversation that you guys had in your workshop and teacher trainings together. As, as well as the energy that you have and the experience around your own mindfulness and Buddhist practice. But also that what really with a spark was, I was, Richard and I were catching up on something and uh, we started talking about Johnny and Richard says, you know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, you know, I'm like standing at a sink or I'm at a counter or tying my shoes or something. Johnny just comes up to me and just drops these Dharma bombs. And I was like, Dharma bombs? Like, what's a Dharma bomb? Richard, how would you describe, number one, what this practice is, and, and why do you call it a Dharma bomb? So I don't really call it a Dharma bomb. Uh, I, I didn't know how else to, to describe it to you, Derek, but I, I would call it more like a sudden moment of awareness, and it's a fantastic practice. Anyone can do it, anytime. It's like coming back to what are you doing right now? Where's your mind? And and you can't, you don't even have time to think about it. So I I really appreciate it that Johnny started doing that. And and it keeps you on your toes. Uh, an excellent thing for a yoga class, uh, people being on their toes and awake and, and ready to do an asana. So we kind of got into a back and forth about, about this. And it was... Um, I think it started to take more of a, it was definitely the Dharma, but it, it became broader than that. It just became, I, I took it as it's like spiritual. You know, I can't do it if it's premeditated. If I think, okay, if Johnny catches me off guard, I'm going to say this, that, that doesn't work because that's mm -hmm. not in the moment. That's totally artificial. And I watched Johnny, the way he teaches in his classes, and I think he's doing this all the time. You know, I think he's noticing people, you know, and it may be just be, you know, Richard, your left elbow, your left elbow. But 
he's encouraging awareness in our practice and when we're not practicing. And so that's how it got started. And it's almost become like, I, I'm a little bit blasé now because, you know, anything could happen around Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny, Johnny, where does where does this this intention and opportunity come from? Well, well, you know, a lot of people get a little skittish around the word spiritual, and it's just you know, mm -hmm. I, I just look at spirituality as just connection. So if I can do this like little playful game with Richard and with other people, it just allows them to stop in the moment, as Richard said. You know, there's a lot of emphasis in Buddhism on first thought, best thought. Like this idea that like, it's your first thought. And then so if I can kind of catch Richard or somebody off guard a little bit, maybe they're lost in thought, which most of the time we are, you know, we're kind of lost in thought. I can snap them out of it with a question, almost like a koan, that makes them shift back into the present moment. And then most of the time, particularly with Richard, the responses then Put me into a contemplation. Put me back. <laughs> put me back and the present. A little moment. judo. A little. A little. We'll take your energy. And then all exactly. Of sudden, all of a sudden, it's like I'm right back to the present moment again. Yeah. So and and I love Richard, and uh, and it allows me to remind him that I love him. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Johnny. Yeah. yeah. Just to remind yeah. him that I love him because if, because if I didn't love him, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. You right. know, I love and care about Johnny, so I'm 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 ready, you know. Yeah. Just hearing you guys talk, I can kind of sense the the good kind of neurochemistry that's happening when you see somebody who you love and care about, which is also something on top of it when you know you're on some similar wavelength with them or or tend to be usually on a similar wavelength when you see them. And maybe they're not having the best day or you're not having the best day, you're not as present or whatever. But there's a great kind of joy and fun in seeing buddies and dudes that you know who are in a place where you want to be or you are and having that appreciation and seeing them. And I think it's a very healthy thing for guys to find those types of relationships. And I think yoga is a great place to have those interactions because usually you're in a class or several guys, you maybe you're not pals after the first uh, down dog. But when you have the repeat overlap and interactions and you get to know that person, it's great having those kind of guys in your lives. You know what, Derek? And I would I would even go a step further and say you have to have those guys. Totally. And if you don't have those guys in your life, then you're a little more lost and a little yeah. less connected. You know, spiritual practice is meant to be done alone and with other people equal. Like it's it's not like this or that. It's like, you know, it's the connection and keeping each other like on point. Helping one another stay on point. Beautifully said, Johnny. Yeah. yeah. Derek, I would add to this that there is no aggression in this exchange whatsoever. Yeah. We, Johnny and I, are, it is a kind of uh, Aikido thing where we're helping each other. You know, and it's not a contest. Nobody's, it's not about winning who has the yeah. best answer or any of that. It's like, can we meet each other now? right now an exchange and usually i mean it just happens the byproduct is i feel great after that whether yeah, i totally I say, you know johnny i don't have anything to say i'm speech you know or whatever yeah. you know because he's just it's blowing always, me away it totally sends me into contemplating <laughs> <laughs> Richard said nothing I'm there's like, like a p wave and s wave there's like you know the johnny coming up and then there's richard's response and then johnny <laughs> kind of you know and reeling back exactly. from that you know yeah, yeah. But what a way to go into a yoga class with your mind sharp and awake and ready. Yes. So that the ne next instruction, when Johnny starts the class, the class has already started for you. Yeah. You know? You're yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's sometimes, so I, um, I live about 35, 40 minutes from Johnny's studio. And, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, early in the morning, there's been, there's just so much traffic getting there. I, I come in there with a moment or two before the class starts. You know, I literally roll yeah. up the mat. I, I usually barely have a minute to check in. 
And it takes me some times in the class, some time to get to a place where you're actually, you know, you're present. You know, you've already been doing the class for 10, 15 minutes. And sometimes I get there on my own eventually, or sometimes it's uh, something Johnny or another teacher is saying that helped help me kind of ground you. And you really have to kind of dump whatever sort of uh, monkey brain has been dragging since the highway as you rolled in. Yeah. Each day is a little different and how easily you can drop in to that state yeah. of being. Yeah. So this is, this is a variation on the cessation of the waves of mind, because that is how you start your yoga practice. That's how the Yoga Sutra starts. It's the cessation of the waves of mind. So you are not caught in the waves of mind when you're doing this kind of awareness practice like Johnny and I are doing. So it's an excellent preliminary to going into the classroom. But it's to me, I mean, you could say spiritual, you know, there's a spiritedness about it when we do it, but it's more like getting to the heart of the matter is the way I see it. Like, mm -hmm. okay, Johnny and I are in the present moment. What's happening? You know, before I can even think about it, what's happening? Yeah. That kind of thing. And that's awareness training, which is going to benefit you in every dimension of your life. I also love what Richard said. It, it's not like aggressive. It's not competitive. And I think as guys, a lot of times, you know, we've been brought up that way. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's a little aggression, there's a little competitiveness. And uh, in general, I mean, I'm just speaking for this guy. Like those two energies are big turnoffs to me. Whether it's a weakness in me, I can't take responsibility for what other people think. Uh, I just know what I think. And aggression is a futile energy. And I also don't really like being competitive with other people. Yeah, it's a it's tiring. And I think as you get to middle age, some guys just they just they just uh have to learn to let go of that some of the stuff. Or I'd like to say kind of becoming more beta in your alpha. Like you don't necessarily Mary. have to dominate the conversation or the room. You can just sit back and and just enjoy <laughs> where you are in that moment. Uh, and uh, so yeah. I, I think there's a huge intention around helping guys through all these different practices and all these different methods to, to start learning, learning how to find that door and learn to go through that door and understand that there's a whole nother way of living and being. There is. And let me just close that up. Just close that loop just for a moment, just because I think in, in letting go of the aggression and competitiveness, then the other guy feels more supported and then it's about challenging yourself. I'm all about like growing and challenging myself. I just don't want it to be at the expense of another human being. Yeah. And I really feel like it's a really important part of who I am is being able to try to encourage as many people as I can, male or female, and to really stay away from the energy of aggression or the energy of competitive, like I'm going to beat you because that's going to make me feel better. Right. And those are just two energies that I don't have any time for. And I just feel like it could help a lot of human beings if they would become more aware of those kind of energy. Yeah. So this reminds me of a quote I heard once, someone who studied with the great Indian philosopher um, Krishnamurti. And Krishnamurti said, pay attention to how you're actually living your life. And is it making you happy? Are you proud of this? Are you happy? You know, is this really moving you in a positive direction? Or are you unconscious? Are you not paying attention? Are you just being carried along by everything and you feel helpless? I see it um, in my corporate world, less so with myself because I, I kind of have my own grounding about where I am now. But I know a lot of people uh, at, at, who have gotten to a point in their career where they're very successful, uh, they have a high level of status, they're paid very well, and they're on a massive conveyor belt that just cannot slow down. Exactly. And, uh, and it's a real struggle with them in their personal lives, with their family, with the relationships, with their social life. And um, probably a little bit of the sweet success that they enjoy, they're, probably their ego enjoys some of that, but also yeah. the sense of real suffering because they really can't get off the conveyor belt. It reminds me of uh, that great documentary that came out about the Grateful Dead, uh, Long Strange Trip that was on Amazon Prime. And there was, uh, there was a quote about how Jerry Garcia 
was really suffering towards the end of his life because he had this awesome amount of responsibility for basically a hundred people in the corporation of the Grateful Dead to uh, keep the tours going, to keep it going. Yeah. And he just really ran out of energy and the desire to keep that going. But to, to oh, yeah. swing it back to your point about, do you know where you are? Do you know where you're going? And, and I think if you don't, then you have this feeling of what you're describing of in being inauthentic. Mm. You're not living your dharma. You haven't even inquired as to what your dharma is. And, and you're creating suffering as a result for yourself and maybe even people around you. And then it might be a good point to just to share with the listeners. What does Dharma mean, Richard? Yeah. It has. So all these important words in Sanskrit and in Tibetan all have many, many meanings. So it could be path. It can mean law. It can mean uh, spiritual practice, truth, or way. So the Buddha's way or Buddha Dharma is referred to a lot in, in Buddhist literature. It's not, I've never seen the word religion uh, attached to it. So it's, um, and I always take it as, this is the Buddha's advice. Like, hey, you know, you're suffering? Try a little meditation, see what happens. And that's very, very much what the Buddha was saying. See for yourself if it makes a difference in your life. Don't take my word for it. But you try it, you know. And Johnny has said this about yoga, too, without even, you know, quoting the Buddha. He said, see if it makes a difference. I see a difference. Do you see a difference? Yeah. You have to see the difference to really believe this. The one thing, too, Richard, with that, it's like boiling it down to even like something even simpler, which I just loved your description, which I was dying just to hear that, like how you would describe Dharma. But it's like, what's your program? And most people just look at you like you have 14 heads. It's like, what do you mean program? I'm like, what's your program? Like, what what program are you on? Like, what is your practice? Like, what do you do? And most people don't have a response to that. Yeah. And so when you don't have a program, then you're going to tend to experience a lot more confusion in life because you don't really have a program that you're on. The program can be of really any nature. And optimally, that program is very individualized towards you and your life. But when you don't have a program, like it points throughout my life when I was off my program, it wasn't good. I'm not my best version of myself when I'm not sticking to my program. And I think that's what's lacking in most people's lives is they don't really have a program. If you don't have a program, put that in your upper left-hand quadrant as the biggest order of importance. You got to get on the program, man. Yeah. It's a good place for us to maybe bring this conversation to close, which is I'm going to go to each of you. How do you find your program? How do you start? Someone who's listening to this conversation, maybe someone who doesn't quite already have a program or a practice. So I'll throw it to Richard first. This is where we started with awareness and we're tying it all up with awareness. Are you looking inside? Are you just looking outside like, well, I want that car or I want, you know, I want to make this amount of money or I want to live in that neighborhood? Because if it's all outside, you don't have a program. The program is an inner program. So that means you're going to have to think. So when are you happiest? What makes you happy? If you're trying to bring something from the outside inside and say, that's your happiness, that's not what I'm talking about. The program is something that you are fully engaged in, body, speech, and mind. And you don't have to have all the answers, but maybe it's something that inspired you or someone that inspired you, whatever it is. Each person has to do this self-inquiry and come up with their own answer. I can't tell anyone, well, this is your answer. Somebody has to you know, do the inner work to find that program. It's not easy. And it's a lifetime. Well, that's always a really tough one to flop. That's a tough <laughs> one. <laughs> I will just share one thought. How individualized a program really is for you, like pivoting off of Richard's response, the famous mythology you know, guru, Joseph Campbell, 
always would say, how do you know if you're on the right path? How do you know if you're on the right program? It's not worn, right? Because if it is, it's somebody else's program. Right. It needs to be your program. Exactly, Johnny. Finding a teacher, finding you know somebody who can help you start to craft your program. Notice knowing that your program will change day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year. But your program will change, but you have a program. And then as you're on that program, you're constantly evaluating the program and making shifts and changes based on kind of where you are in your life and how you need to shift for today or tomorrow or wherever it is that you are. I love it. Well said, both of you. I want to thank you guys for coming out. I knew this would be a great conversation and I always enjoy talking to both of you. So I knew having both of you guys here uh, on the mountaintop has been great. So thank you guys both for coming and uh, we got to do this again. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Johnny. Yep. Good to be with both of you. See you guys.